preach a fundamental lesson this morning. Um, it's pretty well about the foundation of our faith. Uh, I want to cover the idea of we ought to believe in God for a start. We must see the actual state we are in before God. Otherwise, we will do nothing to save our souls. We should believe God loves us. And the last point will be we need to believe that God can save us. So let's start with uh, the first point. We ought to believe in God. <clears throat> it, it is note, noteworthy that the very first verse of the very first book in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That in the beginning is in the beginning of time, of space, of matter, of creation itself. God was there already, and God created everything that is or was created. So the heavens and the earth. Uh, interestingly, uh, in Psalm 33, it teaches, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So we're, we, we're having a profound statement that God spoke everything into existence. This is the nature of the power of God, the, the awesomeness of the God that we're dealing with, the eternal God, the invisible God, who is the creator and maker of all things. <clears throat> it's also uh, important for us to see that there is a difference between God himself and the creation. Other than, other, if we don't see this, we will think that the creation is the eternal thing and not God. It is God who is the eternal one and creation is very much something that has a beginning and something that has an end. Let's look in Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. Psalm 102. <coughs> it says, Of old you founded the earth. This is verse 25 of Psalm 102. Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. So, we see this contrast here. The, the creation will wear out. It will be changed, like clothing will be changed. It is not an eternal reality. In this creation, God comes to the fiat of his creation, which of course was man. And in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, it gives us an insight into what God was doing when he created man and how important man is in the eyes of God. It says in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creek creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So unlike all of the animals which he had created before he came to creating man, he says of man, uniquely says of man, that he is to be created in God's likeness 
and in God's image. He made us to have a relationship with us. We are a special creation. He's given us this earth. And he's talking about the men and the women. He's given us this earth so that we might be lords of this earth, that we might be the rulers of this earth. I, I really do think that uh, we must grasp that uh, with both hands and we must allow that to sink deeply into our souls and into our hearts and minds so that we will accept that we have that we are unique beings and that we have a unique purpose in the universe and before God Almighty. Unfortunately, because man, male and female, rule over all the earth, he has a propensity to think himself a god. So to keep this wild notion in check, we're told, let's look at Psalm now 100 and, and in verse 3. Psalm 100 and verse 3. This is to keep this wild notion of our idea of us, of, our, of ourselves as gods. He says in Psalm 100 verse 3. He says, Know that the Lord himself is God. Now this is Yahweh himself is God. It is he who has made us. We're not made as a figment of our, or God's not made as a figment of our imagination. God is the reality. He has created us. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We had no input into our own creation. We were just not there in the beginning until God created us. Then we found an existence before God. How do we so badly distort the notion that uh, in some way God is under our control and that we've created him rather than him creating us? And yet that's the sort of thinking that goes on in the world if it's not expressed in such, uh, in, in such uh, how was, how was strong language. It is accepted and the behavior just uh, makes it evident that that sort of thinking has been accepted. So we want to get back to what the Bible is saying about us. God is the creator. We are the creatures. We did not make ourselves we are his people. We belong to him. He's our father. He's our creator. We belong to him. And we are the sheep of his pasture. I don't think he's trying to tell us we're stupid. He's just trying to tell us he's given us this beautiful earth here uh, as a place where we can feed and eat and live and enjoy life. And most of all, that we are here so that we might serve him. Serve him under his authority. Just this simple, straightforward idea of acknowledging the existence of the invisible God is fundamental to our faith. It's just fundamental to our faith. If we don't believe this, we're going nowhere. Accepting that he is the creator of all things is fundamental to our faith. <coughs> you will not find any atheist who doesn't believe in God thinking that he needs to come to the God that he doesn't believe in to have forgiveness of sins. What sins? Trusting that he rewards those who seek them is also fundamental to our faith. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 categorically states, And without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he who comes to God must believe that he is, in other words, that he exists, and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. So not only do we believe that God exists, but that he will reward all of us who are trying to seek him, trying to find him, trying to serve him and be obedient to him. That's the essence of our life. And it will certainly be the essence of our eternal life. So that settled. That's what has to happen. We have to believe that in order to be able to move on. Then we must see the actual state we are in before God. If we forget this, we need to be reminded. If we have never really thought about this, we need to think about it. And if we have not accepted it as a fundamental of our faith, we are never going to be saved. Although Adam and Eve knew God, their creator, and it would seem from what is said in the first three chapters of Genesis, that God uh, walked and talked with them. He must have appeared in some human form and walked and talked to them. There was an intimate relationship or fellowship between God and the first man and woman. So they would know God, not know of God, but they would actually know God and who he was and, and what he was. And uh, so they would know God and they were aware of the prohibition given not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now you would think if you knew God that intimately that it would be very difficult to sin. But that's not so. The serpent was able to beguile Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. And I use the word beguile um, because that's exactly what he did. He told her half-truths and lies to get her to believe that she could do it contrary to God's will and God's commandment and still reap the benefit of being like God. By eating, Eve broke faith with God. This term, breaking faith with God, is, was, is an interesting one. You just did not trust God. She did not trust God. She did not believe his commandment. She started to think about how this fruit looked to her. It was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life that caused her to break faith with God and to eat the forbidden fruit. By doing so, she sinned. She transgressed God's law. That's what sinning is, transgressing God's law, breaking the law, the eternal law. She sinned. She then coerced her husband to eat and he sinned. She wasn't going to be alone in this. She dragged him into it. And he, very foolishly, went along with what she had done and did likewise. Now the shocking outcome was both of them were driven out of the Garden of Eden, away from the presence of God, no longer having access to the tree of life, death entered into the world. Psalm 89.48 is, is a direct result of all of that. 89 verse 48. It says, What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? And the answer to that is no. There's no man that can live and not see death. We're all going to die. 
unless we are here on the last day and the Lord just changes us when he comes back again. But the rule is we're all going to die and all of this physical death is not because of your sins. It's because of Adam and Eve's sin. We, we are suffering the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. We're not guilty of the sin, but we suffer the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. And don't curse Adam and Eve because of it. The truth of the matter is, had we been one of the first pair, we would have done exactly the same because we're still doing exactly the same thing. So we know for a fact that they did no more than we would have done under the same circumstances. Fellow sojourners, we also have turned aside from God. So what was said to the king of Tyre can be said to us, you were blameless in your ways from the days you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. God gave us a pure spirit. We are basically good and in tune with goodness and righteousness and truth and holiness. But because of the influences that surround us in a corrupt world and because of our own internal cravings for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, we have turned aside from that. In disobedience, we've turned aside from that to do things that are not proper. And by doing things that are not proper, we are refusing to acknowledge God's authority over us. We're turning our back on him. We're breaking fellowship with him as Adam and Eve broke fellowship with him. So once we do that, once we break fellowship with him, or having broken faith with God, just as Eve had broken faith with God, we have filled our lives with unrighteousness and wickedness. And the extent of it is, is there in Romans chapter 1 for all of us to see. Let's have a look there in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. <coughs> and just as, I'm going to, instead of put they, I'm going to put, just as we did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave us over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, we are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although we know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, we not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. It's funny when you put the we in, instead of they, it's always much easier to read about other people and their faults. It's much more difficult to face the fact that we are the they and that we are the ones that are doing all this unrighteousness. In simple terms, Paul sums it up in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The whole lot of us stand guilty before God. The whole lot of us have transgressed God's law. And by doing so have opened up a Pandora's box in our lives and in the lives of others. We are completely naive when it comes to the effects that it has on our lives 
uh, uh, the effects sinning has on our lives and on the lives of others. The pain and the sorrow, the hurt and the anguish, the distress and the strains that it puts on us as a, a people and that it puts on others who are related to us or who are just in association with us somehow like in work or our neighbours or whatever else uh, it, it's just incredible <coughs> what we're doing to each other <coughs> but be warned if we die in this state if we die doing our own thing Justice demands that we be separated from God for all eternity. Go back to Psalm 92, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> A senseless man has no knowledge. <clears throat> Nor does a stupid man understand this, that when the wicked sprout up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. Behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered, he says. What's Jesus going to say to us on the last day if we die in our sins? In our rebellion and stubborn refusal to do his will. He's going to say, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for you or for the human race. It was prepared for the devil and his angels who deserve to be there. But you, in your madness, have chosen to associate yourself with the devil and his angels so that you might do your own thing and do what is not proper. And do that in rebellion towards God and in the understanding that you might not get away with it. There is no question that you will ever get away with it. God will not leave the guilty unpunished. You will be punished and others will suffer as a result of the lifestyle that you will choose for yourself before God. And we do have a choice. We're either choosing to do the right thing, to be good people, to try and facilitate others before ourselves, or we, uh, or we go for the selfish life, the self-indulgent life, the pride and the arrogance and the nastiness and all that goes with that sort of lifestyle against God's will, and probably in the hope, as I say, that we will get away with it. It's never going to happen. So, is it not sensible? Is it not wise to say, look, let me, let me be saved. And let me be on God's side. And let me do the right no matter what hurt or problems it brings. So that I might be secure in my life here in this earth and in my eternal existence in the next life which when you think about it just outweighs anything that we might consider of importance here in this earth an earth or a life that will last maybe 70 years or if by reason of strength, 80 years or beyond. But it's all labor and sorrow for soon it's cut off and we die.
It is fundamental to our faith that we see our own mortality and if we remain in our sins, the prospect of eternal damnation away from the presence of the Lord is certain. We need to know that. We need to believe that. And in believing that, that will certainly help us to stay on the straight and narrow path which God has asked us to walk in this life. We should believe that God loves us. One of the greatest revelations that God has made in the scriptures is that God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8. God is love. As far as I know, there's not a mention of God being a God of love in the Quran. So this is quite a unique statement about who God is and what God is. Just to talk about love, uh, again we get, we get very impractical about love. It's all the airy-fairy, the emotional stuff that uh, most people are into and uh, it hasn't got anything to do with reality or it's, it's more fairy tale stuff so what the, the love of God is is reality it, has, it deals with reality and it it, it helps produce certain um, uh, disposition in God towards us and I'd like you to have a look here in uh, where is it Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18 It says there, therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He doesn't long to condemn you. He doesn't long to see you dead. He doesn't hold any malice towards you. He's a loving God. Now he will not allow the guilty to go unpunished because he's also a just God. He has to be consistent with himself and his characteristics. But in deep down inside his heart he longs to be gracious to us humans us sinners therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you he's waiting for you to move in, the, in his direction there are certain things you have to do in order that that com compassion can become activated on your behalf for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. It was one of those scriptures that, you know, when you're looking through the Bible or you're reading and uh, you're not looking for this at all. You're, you're looking for something else and then you come across this and it just opens itself up like a flower in front of you. And you see how wonderful God is and how kind and and this loving kindness that pours out of us, out of him on our behalf. How can we resist that? How can we just uh, trample that on the foot? When he was even giving the law to Moses, the Lord let them know that he was something greater than the law. In Exodus chapter 34, 6 through 8. It says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, Yahweh that is, the, the Yahweh God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, the, the loving kindness there is steadfast love. Loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgression 
and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now, if you're like me, when I read this first, the thing I lighted on was visiting the iniquity on the children and the grandchildren. That seems horrible. But it's, no, it's not horrible. It's the actual reality that we've created for ourselves. We influence our children. If we've sinned, they want to copy our lives. Or if we've glorified sin in any way before them, they'll think, oh, that's great. If we condone it and support it or turn a blind eye to it and pretend it really doesn't matter, then all you're doing is encouraging them to be or disobedient to God and you're, you're not concerned one whit about what the outcome will be for them. I tell you, we're more annoyed about our children annoying us and aggravating the life out of us by their selfishness and their heartlessness. But wouldn't it be more in keeping with what we are as Christians to really be upset with the fact that not only are they aggravating me, but worse of all, they are, they are affronting God with what they're doing. They're challenging God in the lifestyle they're leading. They're lost sinners. Would to God we were worried about those things. We spend so much time and so much money giving them a good education so they can be clever sinners. I'm not saying don't give them an education. Of course you give them an education. But it's this whole business of this is the be all and the end all of everything. It'll secure your life for you in the future. It will make you walk in circles of people that uh, are respected. It'll, it'll uh, give you dignity and, and, and an ability in life. And this becomes the all-important thing for our children and our grandchildren. Surely to God, we're not so lacking in faith as to not be able to see that they are in a terrible state because they're lost before God and they continue to turn their back on the love of God and the patience of God and the mercy of God. Even, even with all of this, God still stretches out his hand towards them in love. The apostles said, we are witnesses to the fact that God sent his son to be the saviour of the world. 1 John 4 verse 14. What's this world? This is the world of sinful mankind. This is the world of rebellion. This is the world of transgressions. God sent his son, his son, to be the saviour of this world. This was an act of deep compassion and love for lost souls. And that love is expressed to us in John 3.16, very well known to all of us. For God so loved the world... The intensity of it can't be expressed here. But it says, So loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He so loves you that he gave the greatest gift that he could give his only begotten Son to die for you. 
to die as a sin sacrifice for you so that you could have forgiveness of your sins so that you could be cleansed from all unrighteousness so that your faith could be counted as righteousness before God that you become acceptable to God and he has promised that he is slow to anger and not only that, that he does forgive iniquities and transgressions and sins continually because of what Jesus Christ has done for us as a race. In this is love, not that we loved him and we certainly did not love him, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4 verse 10. Propitiation is a sacrifice for sin. Jesus was sent to give his life as a sin sacrifice for our many transgressions so that we could have God's forgiveness and cleansing of our sins. And Isaiah foresaw what that would entail for him. Isaiah chapter 53. Four through six. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well being fell upon him. By his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Had he not loved us and been willing to come to die for us, we could not have been released from our sins. We would have died in our sins and we would be, and we would be forever separated from God for all eternity. All this happened for us while we were yet sinners. Would you die for a righteous man? I don't believe we would. God sent his son to die for wicked, rebellious people so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Romans 5, 6 to 8. The question now with that is, with that information is, do you now believe that God loves you? Because it's fundamental to our faith that we accept that God loves us. Even as Christians, we need to continue to believe that God loves us. We get times in our lives where we distance ourselves from God and we become lonely. But instead of just going back to God in repentance and faith, we'll stay in our loneliness believing I'm unloved. Nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. Well, even if there's nobody in the whole wide world who, who doesn't love you, there is one who loves you. And that's God. He loves you. With an everlasting love, we're told. Because that's the only way God can love. So do you believe now that God loves you? Along with that, we need to believe that God can save us. God can save us, but we need to come to him through Jesus to remove the barriers of our iniquities and sins, or the barrier which our iniquities and sins have created between us and God. Isaiah 53, you're there. Um, uh, 59, I should say, 1 and 2. Just turn to it. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that he, it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And he gives a list of things that they were doing and continue to do and uh, which were a barrier between them and God. 
So God has the power to save you. God has an ear to hear your prayers. God has love and a sacrifice that can atone for your sins. But you need to be willing to acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you need your sins forgiven and that God is the only one who can forgive you of your sins and that you've got to come to him on bended knee as it were and ask for the forgiveness of sins through our Lord Jesus Christ or the blood, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews who along with the Romans crucified Jesus were confronted with our sinful crime by the Apostle Peter and in them being confronted with that crime we're confronted with that crime. They nailed him to the cross but since he was dying for my sins have I not got a part in that? Am I not guilty of putting him up there? Is it everybody else's fault that he had to die for the sins of the world or to be the saviour of the world? No, it's mine too. Let's look in Acts chapter 2. Beginning with 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Jump down to verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb was with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore having received or having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven but he himself says the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The Father was on his side. The Father accepted his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And because Jesus was sinless, he couldn't be held in the power of death. He was raised up again on the third day. He ascended into heaven after the 40 days. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God. He is both Lord and Messiah. He is the Savior. Now when they realized they, they'd done such a terrible or committed such a terrible sin, they said, brethren, what shall we do? They now believed that they had crucified their own Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah. Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just imagine that. You've crucified the Son of God, and you ask, what can we do? I would probably have said to them, you can do nothing. You've done everything you can do to destroy him, and he's not destroyed. Now there's no way back for you. But God's much more compassionate than I am. 
much more loving than I am, much more forgiving than I am, or any human is. He says, you repent. You repent. Change your mind about the sins you've committed. Ask forgiveness for them and be baptised in identification with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. God was willing to wash those sins away to forgive him or forgive them of all their sins. And that's what he's done for you. You became a Christian. That has happened. And if you continue when you commit a sin to confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to count you righteous. He continues to do that for us. Time after time after time, mistake after mistake, rebellion after rebe rebellion, sin after sin, transgression after transgression. For as long as we live, he is prepared in love and through the blood of his son to wash away your sins. If you have a heart to ask and to repent and to confess. What was spoken by Peter was the word of faith, as Paul calls it, which he was preaching also. This is the word of faith. We need to have, we need to believe these words. We need to have faith in the reality of what has taken place in order for our sins to be forgiven. Let's look at... Um, Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Paul's at the city of Corinth. He's preaching the gospel. And the result was, verse 8, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. Crispus wanted out of his sins. Many of the Corinthians wanted out of their sins to hear the gospel, the good news that there is a way out for me and you was wonderful in their eyes. They couldn't believe how blessed they were. I'm fortunate that they had heard that God was for them and not against them. That God loved them and God was willing to forgive them. No wonder they believed and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. There are other scriptures we can go to. We just don't have the time to go there right now. What, we're, what I'm going to say is, are you prepared to hear the word of God? Do you believe the word of God? Will you repent of your sins and be buried in water for the forgiveness of your sins? All of these things are fundamental to our faith in God and our salvation from sins. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, please, please, please give consideration to what's been said here. And don't hesitate to do what's right in this matter. If you are a Christian and you're withholding your sins, you need to confess your sins. You need to turn away from your sins and ask God for forgiveness for your sins. But in that confession, there has to be a repentance. And in that repentance, there has to be a changed life. Things have to change. And you have to want them to change. Then all will be well between you and God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you can look forward with great joy. To what is to come. In the life hereafter. I'll leave it with you. Thank you.